I really appreciate everyone um, coming out, so to speak, for this slightly unusual forum, but I think we've got some really uh, interesting information to share. So I'm going to kick it off talking a little bit about data in general and some trends that we at Streetlight have been measuring since this crisis started. And then we'll hand it off to Ron and Eric to do the more deep thinking about sort of what it all means. So just very briefly, uh, as Nico said, Streetlight is a transportation analytics firm. Uh, we provide a software called Streetlight Insight that allows anyone who's a client to log in and quickly measure any type of transportation behavior anywhere in the US and Canada. Um, recently, we've been saying we're sort of like the Zoom of traffic studies. And the way we're able to do that is by taking advantage of the billions of mobile devices that have already been deployed across the world in the form of smartphones, connected cars, connected trucks, and merging that with other types of data, data from embedded sensors, data from the census, the American Community Survey, all sorts of other types of data to make sense out of all those pings. And here on the video, you see what those raw pings look like. It's our job to turn that into clear, useful analytics for the transportation community. So we have used all that data to find out the shocking discovery that US vehicle miles traveled has dropped very dramatically. Um, so we have calculated total US VMT uh, every day and are still posting that on our website every day uh, since the crisis. And what you see very clearly is a huge precipitous fall uh, starting around the 12th or 13th of March. Um, and this graph ends on May 1st, slight uptick. So VMT is down. But could have you looked out your window. So, so what? What does this data mean? Well, one really important conclusion I want to share with everyone is that it is not down in the same way everywhere. There's a lot of local nuance and granularity. The way this crisis is affecting transportation is just not universal. So this map shows you May 1st, 2020, and the more yellow the county is, the more significant the VMT fall off has been. And if the county is gray, it just means it's a very small population county. So you see these just huge yellow zones in the urban and the coasts and more of these grays. Now, this doesn't mean that VMT hasn't gone down. It has, just not to the same magnitude as the, as the more yellow counties. This map is also updated daily and is available to anyone to look at on our website. So point number one, we can use data to show that this crisis is not the same everywhere and not the same for everyone. Uh, so here is an animation. We're starting March 1st and we're moving through time and watching the fall off through the two months. And you'll see these yellow flashes. Those are weekends because our baseline day is an average weekday. But you see the country getting basically yellower and yellower. Um, and then you see right at the beginning of May, which is where we are about now, some places starting to, to be more gray, which means they just haven't fallen off to the same degree they had. They're starting to come back. So another way that things are not the same everywhere is obviously a rural urban divide. And I thought that would be particularly useful for this audience. So what this graph shows is the same VMT trend, but the red line is the average of all rural counties, according to sort of standard definitions of rural. And the blue line is the average of all urban counties. Not only is the fall off different, the recovery is looking different. Again, not totally shocking. So we can dig in more having this wealth of data and ask why. Um, well, one thing we found is that the rural urban split is not the same everywhere. Even that is not consistent. So this is just a, a small multiples graph of all the different states. As you can see, there's a lot of difference. Let's zoom in. In Oregon, where I picked because of our hosts, uh, the rural urban divide is not so extreme. It's pretty tight, though the last few days it's been separating more. But in Georgia, which has gotten a lot of press for sort of some conflict between Atlanta and the governor, you see a really much bigger difference in the magnitude of VMT decline uh, between the urban areas and the rural areas. So even the urban rural divide isn't enough to explain the diversity, we need more. Luckily, we also can combine Streetlight's VMT data with data about income. And income really matters, even beyond the urban rural divide. So in the urban counties, the wealthier the income is, so the further out we are on this x-axis, you are likely to see far more VMT decline in a wealthier urban county than in a low income urban county. So income is really affecting what's happening. What's interesting is in the rural uh, counties, the effect is about of income is about one third that 
of the effective income in the urban counties. Now, one of the reason is you just have a lot less um, diversity of incomes in rural counties. They all just tend to be more similar. Um, but that's also interesting because I think it gets to sort of the fundamental nature of what it means to be living uh, rurally and what your opportunities are to actually reduce your BMT. So income matters, urban versus rural matters. Even within what we classify as urban and rural counties, the extent of your density really matters. So again, on the x-axis here, we have population density. And on the y-axis, we have to change, or the VMT, uh, compared to March 1st. And again, in urban counties, the denser you are, the more your VMT is falling off. The effect is not as clear in the rural counties, but again, we have sort of less spread in what density means to work with. So urban versus rural matters, density matters, income matters, but we still haven't explained the full effect. There's still a lot of diversity. So we pushed further, this is less of a beautiful chart, and we use data about um, the types of jobs that are in each county. And what we find is that this is really starting to help us explain the change in transportation. So if you have extra jobs in educational services, scientific and technical services, where I think is where I would fall as a tech person, finance, IT, federal government, arts, those jobs are associated with a really strong VMT fall off. But different jobs, utilities, construction, local government, manufacturing, if your county or your region or your city has those jobs, you're seeing much less of a decline in VMT. And when we think about how we plan for our own communities, right, because I think a lot of this audience is in charge of planning for a particular community, um, we really, we can't look at these national trends. We have to look granularly at all these different factors to understand what has been happening in our communities and what may happen in the future. So uh, Nico mentioned e-commerce and that's a big topic for today. Um, we did a study with BCG uh, that looked at uh, the level of activity at several thousand uh, postal service, UPS and FedEx warehouses. Um, and this shows you these different weeks. February is the baseline, and then you see the weeks of March building up. What was really interesting, and I think counterintuitive, is that activity in UPS and FedEx has actually fallen off after an initial surge. And you might be like, well, but why? We all hear that e-commerce is up like 20%. It's because a lot of what these parcel services provide for is actually businesses. So what we're seeing is a shift in where these delivery fleets go, right? The e residential or you know, individual e-commerce is way up, but the sort of daily delivery of goods to manufacturers, to restaurants, a lot of restaurants, to clothing stores, all of the other world of commerce that used delivery or freight, that is down. Um, so what that means is it's not so much an increase, I see it as a shift in the places where we can expect to see trucks um, or small trucks or big trucks. And that is very important as we think about what our streets need to look like and need to be built for. Lastly, USPS up and up and up. Um, and I think that trend continues um, as they are more focused on residential. So I hope this data helps ground the conversation um, because I think that in this time of uncertainty, we're all susceptible to sort of making decisions based on anecdotes because nobody knows what's going on. And if you hear that is compelling from one city or one country, we're sort of cotton indicator of the future. But what I wanted to share with this group is that data is available, right? You can measure some of these things. Um, and I think it's important to measure what's happening but it's also important to think about how we can use this data to help us come back better than we were before. And there's a lot of questions we need to answer and that we can answer with data. And so one thing I wanna emphasize is that what we see clearly is that the trends are not consistent across the US and Canada, right? Granular data needs to inform local decisions. Just because something is happening to a city you know, at the top of California doesn't mean the same thing is happening in the city in the bottom of California, and it's going to be totally different in Iowa and Georgia. So we need to think locally because the effect is very diverse. And when we return and answer some of these questions, that localization will be critical as well. In addition, what this says to me is something I've been thinking for a while, which is that this notion of long range planning that a lot of us have, where we go and do like a survey every three, five or 10 years, 
I've been thinking we need to sort of throw out this way of thinking for a long time, and, and COVID is just doubly underlining that. Um, we have so much data available today that I think we all need to move to a model that plans, implements the plans, see how it's going, measure it, adjust, remeasure it. Our notions of how people will respond to a price signal to take transit versus drive, all of that needs to be thrown out of the window after COVID, just as one tiny example. So I also hope uh, that we can think about moving to a more uh, iterative notion of planning and making decisions for our communities uh, in this time of really increased uncertainty. So that's what I wanted to share. I will turn it over to Ron for the next part. Thank you, Laura. That was terrific. Uh, Laura's done a good job of giving us an idea how uh, data uh, can really answer a lot more questions uh, than maybe we could in the past. And I want to put that in a bit of a context of transportation planning and how we've traditionally used data and what's been evolving just over the last few years and what's been accelerated by uh, the COVID-19 effects. I'm going to start real high level here, population projections. If you think about transportation planning over the last few decades, it's largely focused on expanding infrastructure to keep pace with the population growth. Um, but population growth is declining. Um, this is from the U.S. Census Bureau looking out over the next few years um, with the potential for a decline in population uh, by 2030. Uh, here in California, where I do a lot of my work, uh, we've got uh, new revised population projections just in the last few months showing um, a reduction of about 5 million people in the year 2050 compared to forecast just a couple of years ago because of these effects. And so we really have to kind of take a pause and, and figure out, well, if we're no longer expanding the network, what are we doing? We're largely going to be managing the network we already have to try and achieve those uh, outcomes that our communities desire most. Let's go to the next slide. And to do that, we need to pay attention to the trends and as Laura described, um, measure frequently. Um, so when we use these three, five, 10 year surveys, they do paint a picture um, and there has been some clear trends but the trends are accelerating. Uh, this is from the National Household Travel Survey, where basically we've been seeing a reduction in personal travel that coincided with things like internet shopping and telecommuting, uh, with a pretty significant reduction in things like uh, home-based shopping trips. Um, what does that mean and, and how is COVID-19 affecting it? Well, it's accelerating the ability to stay home um, and not uh, have to leave your home to obtain goods or services or social interactions, uh, even though we may desire many of those things. Uh, so the question um, as we kind of go forward is what types of data, what types of tools, what type of models are we going to be building to answer the, the, the new questions we'll be facing? Let's go to the next slide. And you see some real limitations with the way we do uh, typical forecasting and planning that looks out 10, 20, even 30 years. Even our most advanced models have a pretty simplistic view of the world uh, as shown on the picture on the right here. Uh, even if we're able to keep track of all the tours of someone for their daily travel, there's a lot typically left out of these models. Uh, an actual view of travel uh, is better represented on the picture on the right here, where there's a number of activities we engage in in the home now uh, because we don't have to leave. Uh, but there's also new trips we create where we're not the person traveling, the food delivery, the Amazon trips. Uh, again, those are typically not included in the models and the supply chain that supports them are also not included, but has real impact on what's happening on the, the transportation network. So these are some of the trends that we need to be able to capture and really um, things like big data uh, allow us to do that in almost real time. Let's go to the next slide. So some of the questions that have already started to emerge for us are these travel pattern changes and Laura hinted at them, the fact that we've got increased online shopping and reduced in-store shopping. And we can measure that, um, not only measuring the location where it's occurring, um, but also where the delivery is occurring. And in the cases of uh, an urban downtown, you may see increased demand at the curb, uh, whether it's for apartment buildings or when we return to our offices at the office location. And that's created new types of analysis uh, for us, you know, looking at curb space demand and the competi competition for it. Uh, so we've actually created models that look at that short term demand and help, you know, helping cities try to understand what is the trade off between allocating space for freight and goods. It's a very different perspective of, of modeling, much more short term. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, but stepping back for a second, again, big picture here. When we think about what we do in transportation planning, oftentimes there's a problem identified that we're supposed to, to solve. 
And prior to uh, COVID-19, the most common problem was congestion. Uh, wherever we go in the U.S., that's a, that's a pretty typical um, uh, problem. And this is an example from California that's ex been experiencing increasing congestion over the last few years. And they've got a whole planning process designed around developing projects to reduce congestion. But in reality, um, we're not seeing a return on that investment such that we've seen much in the way of reduction in congestion. Um, and I think it's in part because of how we use the data and how we use the models, we don't always accurately describe the problems. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, if we think about how congestion is typically defined, the cars are moving too slow um, or travel times are unreliable. Well, that's really a symptom. It's a symptom of what I'm gonna call poor seat utilization and mispricing travel. Let's go to the next slide. When you dig a little deeper into the problem, as Laura was suggesting, um, and start using different types of metrics. This one is one of my favorites. It's called seat utilization. Uh, we're measuring the number of occupied seats. And in this case is a freeway uh, screen line that includes the parallel rail and bus service. Uh, and this is measuring the peak hour, peak direction. And what this chart shows based on scale is that we have 40,000 empty seats in that peak hour, peak direction on the freeway uh, and just a few hundred empty seats on transit. Um, so this is a corridor today that is actually being evaluated to expand, to add HOV or hot lanes because of the congestion on the, on the corridor. Um, but that's really the, the wrong solution. And for trying to reduce congestion and meet other um, objectives, such as in, environmental goals like greenhouse gas reduction, we really need to be thinking about how do we fill these seats? And that's a different type of question. Um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see that a lot of that traditional approach to problem solving has also led to missed expectations. This is again from California. Uh, over the last two decades, added almost uh, 1,400 miles of HOV or hot lanes, uh, yet congestion got worse as we saw in the earlier slide and carpool mode share went down. Uh, so we're not getting the, the return on the investment that uh, we'd hoped for, and in part because we've not used the data um, correctly or not analyzed the problem correctly. So we do have an opportunity, um, a little bit of a reset. Let's go to the next slide, caused by the pandemic. Uh, and this is a time for us to pause and reflect over the next uh, few weeks, months, um, to see if there's things that we want to do differently. Uh, this is a, a graphic showing what was happen happening um, since about 2013 with all the disruption and travel associated with technology and the sharing economy. Uh, we went from having to own our cars or rent them for a full day or take a taxi to having access to a variety of, of vehicle types and only paying for it when we needed to make a trip. And the same thing happened for bikes and scooters. We expected the next tipping point to be autonomy, but in between we ran into the pandemic. So we do have an opportunity to take a pause here and think about the different types of outcomes we want and how the data can help us um, evaluate those, those opportunities. And I want to take this opportunity to think about um, the fact that there's a little bit of a sense of urgency here. Um, we've had states starting to lift their shelter in place orders. And I wanna show you this next slide, which is from Wuhan, China. This is TomTom Tom, uh, traffic. And this measures the bright red lines here, the live congestion over the last seven days. Um, and there's a little dashed blue line in the back that's the average congestion from 2019. They've already started to surpass the previous peaks of 2019. So we do have a bit of sense of urgency here to think about the kinds of changes we want and how we're gonna answer the types of questions that are emerging and doing it quickly enough that we can have some real change. So I've got a list here on the next slide of just a few of the questions that have started to emerge from our clients. And I don't have time to get through all these, but I'm gonna highlight a couple. Um, transit agencies, for example, um, definitely in, in uh, tough circumstances with uh, revenue losses. So we're getting new questions. How to operate transit to maximize ridership and revenue. Um, at the same time that they're dealing with how to fund transit so it's free for essential workers. Uh, very different questions than we've had in the past. Um, and I'm gonna skip to that last one here, how to flatten demand curves for travel on facilities with limited supply. Through COVID-19 uh, responses, we saw the ability to flatten the curve based on hospital capacity. What if we took that same approach to transportation into roadway space, for example? Let's go to the next slide. Here's that uh, same uh, road segment I had shown earlier and the speed profile, the congestion that existed prior to COVID-19. And here's what it looks like today under the COVID-19 shelter in place orders here in California. We're at free flow speeds. Um, hit one mouse click, uh, Laura, please. Um, here's the desired speed range for a number of co-benefits. We can provide reliable travel times and speeds while at the same time minimizing things like air pollutants and greenhouse gas emissions. 
we don't have to necessarily fall back into that same old W-shaped pattern on the left. How we manage um, the demand, how we manage rent meters, how we manage school start times, government office start times, or even business start times, things like staggering them, um, can result in a much better outcome than we've experienced in the past. And we have that opportunity, but the opportunity is probably a pretty small window. With that, I'll transfer it to Eric for a few additional thoughts. Ron and, and Laura, we're, we're just saying, but um, just kind of take a, take a big step back, um, just as we kind of wrap up here, just identify as many trends um, as, as I could, just knowing that it's those trends that are going to shape our future. Um, you know, however, you know, while doing that, you know, it's important also to, you know, acknowledge that it's, it's something that's happening to us. We, you know, we very much have, um, you know, agency in, in the outcome. Next slide. Um, if you could actually go one more slide as well. Cool. So, you know, our primary measurable, you know, throughout the, the crisis has been the curve. So, you know, the rate of new infections, um, you know, we've, we've done a good job, obviously, of, of, of flattening that, you know, through, you know, basically manipulating space and time. Um, and, you know, space has expanded, right, um, literally through physical distance and, and, and time has kind of slowed down and warped, you know, things just literally just aren't according, um, you know, happening according to the same schedule that we're, that we're used to. Um, but what has also occurred, um, and kind of echoing some of the things you've already heard, is just this, with really seemingly no great strategy, there's just kind of this expansion um, as, of the realm of possibilities as to, as to what the future could, could really look like. Next slide. Um, so we're, we're all kind of this, this kind of shared experience, you know, um, but at the same time, our, our experiences can just be, be vastly different, you know, which, which Laura was, was kind of expanding on. You know, some of those differences are they're shaped by location, where we're on the nation, obviously, you know, demographics, where we're in our life, um, you know, where we, where we get our information from and, and so on and so forth. Next slide. Um, but, you know, coming back to this, this idea of the curve again, um, it struck me that, you know, um, uh, that, sorry. It's something that these, these curves are, they're, they're similar to, to how you would describe these, these kind of distributions of responses, you know, we've seen from people, you know, um, their behavior around each other at, at the grocery store, for instance, you know, more philosophical questions like, like, what do we owe each other to more kind of response oriented questions like, you know, how flat does the curve need to be, you know, before we, you know, reopen parts of our uh, economy. Next slide. And and just like that, you, you've got these different distributions of responses. You've also you've got these different trends um, that we can put into different buckets, right? They're generally kind of coinciding with with the, what stage they're in and, and the you know when their impact will be felt, and you know whether that's right now or whether they're just kind of forming and and we'll be you know hearing from them in the in the near future. Um, next slide. So you know these are these are trends that are just kind of kind of boom. They're just kind of kind of happening right now. Um, I don't have time to, to go over them all, so we'll just maybe pick a couple. Um, so starting at the beginning, you know, aside from the, the virus itself, which is you know, the most unpleasant effect, you know, it's really been, just been the unprecedented number of layoffs uh, in our country. You know, as of, of this week, I was just reading this morning, there's 36 million claims for unemployment, and we're on our way to kind of 20% unemployment in the country as, as we head into the summer. So that's, that's literally, you know, um, kind of Great Depression levels of, of unemployment. Um, uh, more people are working from home, <laughs> not exactly breaking news, you know, like every day, you know, for some, some people are working even more often, you know, working from home has tripled from 8 million to 25 million, I think it is since January, um, you know, um, with respect to groceries, you know, before the crisis, I think 3% grocery sales were online, you know, I'm seeing predictions that that will move into the double digits, um, you know, once it's all over, and I would, I would, I would generally believe that um, Instacart has been hiring on a tear, as has Amazon and Whole Foods. Um, you know, maybe skipping down to the bottom here with respect to, to cheap gas, you know, the, the price of gas is at, at decade lows, basically, but, you know, that doesn't mean that the, the more of it's been used, you know, like in California, where I am, um, gas consumption is, is down to 25% of what it previously was, you know, which has led to some of the cleanest air in generations, um, and, and obviously a, a decline in, in greenhouse gas emissions, um, you know, because that goes along with that. Next slide. Um, so, you know, I read this great line um, the other day, um, the pandemic has paused the present and forced us to live in the future. And, and that's what this category kind of feels like to me. It's just kind of this acceleration of trends that were already occurring, essentially. Um, you know, again, 
bouncing to, to telework. It, it applies to the, the 40 or, or 60 percent of people of jobs that can be done from home, you know, but it's, it's hard to imagine that, that employers be just kind of putting that toothpaste back on the tube anytime soon. Um, you know, with respect to the restaurant industry, you know, aside from some of those national job, job losses that I, that I noted, you know, this is, this is where the news is, is pretty grim. Um, restaurant spending down, you know, approximately 60 percent. Um, recent national polls that you know, approximately 70 percent of small restaurants think that they might fail if, if the, the closure were to go on for four, uh, four months or longer. Um, with respect to telehealth, you know, I'm hearing from a, a major healthcare client of mine that they're they're targeting increasing the percentage of, of telehealth visits to 25 percent after the pandemic, um, and that's up from two percent prior to all of this. Um, and they also said that 60 percent of their current visits are actually occurring um, via telehealth. You know, with respect to the big companies, particularly the big tech companies, you know, they, they continue to roll so that the Amazons and the Googles and the, and the Microsofts of the world, you know, the, the combined value of, of their, um, of their uh, companies is up $750 billion in the last month. And, and just to give you some perspective on that, that, that increases alone is worth about 20 General Motors uh, or about two um, Walmarts. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so, so let's move a little bit further out um, and just kind of allow ourselves to, to speculate um, a little bit. Um, you know, so nearly a third of all Americans are considering moving, I saw in a, in a recent poll to a less densely populated area. You know, whether or not, you know, homes are actually available in those areas is, is uh, you know, unclear, but it, it stands to reason that the kind of the, the second and the third, third tier cities, you know, which kind of have a, a little bit of distancing kind of built in already. You know, can, could benefit from the crisis down the line. Um, you know, skipping to kind of the commercial real estate, the the failure of retail and restaurant spaces. You know, not to mention office spaces. What what Nico mentioned previously, it's going to be just just real hardship in that space, um, which will kind of alter the way we experience cities and in particular our main streets. Um, with respect to the the sharing economy, um, you know, layoffs at the, the kind of the superstar companies, the Uber and the Lyft and the Lime and the Airbnb. You know, you know, kind of, kind of speak for themselves, obviously, with respect to those companies and, and kind of preparing for the unknown. You know, even with all those companies kind of taking proactive measures to assure, you know, their, their customers and, and employees, you know, um, with, you know, about hygiene and, and the like, you know, it's just another category. And it's just kind of hard to imagine that there will be a return to normal until there's, you know, some sort of vaccine. Um, and maybe skipping down to, to business and tourism travel, it's just that the question is whether it's going to be reduced or deferred or, or just eliminated, um, you know, based on, um, based on what we all, all get used to um, in, the, in the coming years. So let's, let's skip to the next slide now. Um, so, and then, and then maybe one more. This one? There we go. Yeah, that the the one with the the yeah responses require fast and slow thinking. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, so we've we've kind of identified all these trends of, of different magnitudes and, and timelines and, and levels of certainty. Um, it's it's kind of like the definition of, of nonlinearity here. It's just literally factors that affect other factors. Um, you know, some of the some of the data is clear, um, but um, you know, as as noted by Lauren Ron. Um, but what, you know, I'm hoping should be abundantly clear um, is that this is just a, a time for systems thinking. So this is fast thinking is in, you know, what can we do right now in a pre-vaccine world and, you know, slow thinking is in, you know, how can we kind of thoughtfully kind of shape the, the future. Next slide. And go through this this quickly, um, just to just illustrate a couple, you know, we've, we've got these kind of fast monetary responses like from the Fed and you know, although, you know, pretty far from perfect from, you know, Congress and state and local governments um, and maybe bouncing down here to the bottom, you know, in, in my industry, you've got, you've got cities and, and transportation agencies kind of doing real yeoman's work, um, you know, keeping transit running for essential workers and, and closing streets for people and kind of repurposing curb and parking for, for restaurants to use. I've read a lot about that lately. So next slide. Um, and then you've got these these kind of slow responses, right, to, to some of these more insidious challenges, frankly, that that have been heightened by the crisis. And and to be clear, I, I really think it's, it's it's a response to these problems by which you know history will will really judge us. Um, so you know how to rethink our systems um, in order to kind of preserve some of the gains that we like. Um, I've mentioned some of them as of others. Um, you know, cleaner air and more space for people and less time commuting and more time with their families and you know less traffic deaths and the like. 
um, you know, standard public transit back up, you know, because that's, that's how cities work, um, you know, reducing inequality of experiences and, and, you know, kind of sustaining our ingenuity um, through fatigue over, over what I can only imagine will be just a really long sustained um, response. Um, let's go to the next slide. It's kind of like wrapping up. Um, I'm just going to end with just a, a coming up, a couple of assertions, just based on just kind of living with this stuff for the for the past few weeks. You know, we'll wait for the the models to be uh, to be developed, and and you know, Ron and, and Laura and myself can continue to get additional information in order to get a a, a clear view into the future. But um, just a couple points here. So. Um, you know, number one, the, the novelty is, is just worn off for most people. Um, you know, it probably never really took hold for others. Um, but just a return to life, you know, as we had, had to come to know us, it's just, just a long way off. You know, it's, it's, we're all basically living in that, that quote, you can never go home again. Um, but, you know, that's an opportunity, which is, which is good, because this is a, a real warning. Um, you know, it's a twofold one, in fact. You know, even though, you know, greenhouse gas emissions had dropped by about 5% during this time, you know, obviously not the way we want to go about doing that. You know, that that alone is still less than the type of reductions that are required, you know, in order to kind of help with the worst of climate change. And and, and further, just the, the type of cooperation that's required, um, you know, this doesn't seem to currently be within our grasp. Um, you know, uh, third one, <laughs> it's more of a reminder to myself more than anything, but, you know, spending so much time in the future, you know, by doing that, we risk just not appreciating opportunities for change in the present. So we should all kind of appreciate that as well. Um, and then in last year, hopefully, and hopefully ending on a little bit of a bright note, you know, it feels kind of like the perfect application of uh, kind of nothing happening in decades and then decades happening in weeks, you know, it's just a, kind of the ultimate shakeup, right? And, it, and at minimum, something that, you know, kind of helps us reimagine this, this kind of realm of possibilities in the future. You know, whether that's, you know, redesigning streets or cities or just, you know, kind of, again, echoing from a previous, you know, spending more time with our families or, or hopefully just, you know, kind of redefining, um, you know, what we owe each other. So that's it. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Laura, Ron, and Eric. Uh, this is, I'm Becky Steckler, and I'm the program director at Urbanism Next. And uh, really thrilled to have you all on. And I, uh, I'm excited to ask you just a few questions uh, for the participants uh, and attendees. Uh, definitely feel free to use the question and answer. And if there's a question you are just dying for me to ask our panelists uh, throughout the day, definitely uh, uh, use the thumb up, uh, click that, and that will help to, to raise it up, basically upvote it. So I, I'm gonna actually combine two different questions here because one of the things that I have loved about working from home is uh, as being able to go out and go for a walk almost every day. And I know others are playing basketball with their kids. Um, and of course I'm doing that for recreation, not necessarily to travel. And so, um, so I'm just wondering if you are tracking, um, you know, the number of people that are, are walking and biking a lot more. And of course, sometimes they're gonna do that for recreation, but other times they're actually gonna be doing it um, and, and replacing a, a, maybe a different type of trip. So, um, so are we just, uh, are we actually reducing VMT by maybe walking and biking a little bit more, or are we just uh, taking those trips from transit? Do you have a sense of, of what's happening, what's happening right now? So I can start and then FNP folks, feel free to jump on. So our, uh, it was a bit of a scramble. We invented our daily updating metrics in the course of a week. Uh, when this all started, we usually just take a lot more time to do normalization and update like once a month. Um, so we have not gotten there on bike and ped yet, though we're working very hard to try to get it to that speed. So I don't have like a deep statistically rigorous answer for you. It is obvious that walking and biking are up, but I think your concern is correct. Walking and biking is good for a lot of reasons, but from a carbon perspective, if it's not reducing a vehicle miles traveled, it's sort of like a neutral thing that's just good for community and health, not necessarily good for greenhouse gas emissions. So we're not there yet, um, but I believe that it is, it's not gonna be one-to-one, -one, right? All these walk trips are not reducing VMT. So we're gonna be working on that study later in the summer. The only thing I would add to that, uh, I was able to uh, join Becky on one of her uh, walks as a uh, digital member of that, uh, that walking group. And so if you compare and contrast though, the notion of being in a, a workplace office and having a conference call uh, versus going and doing it while you're walking. Um, 
that is a pretty dramatic difference in terms of your, your personal health um, and it, to the extent that you didn't have to make the trip to the office to, to have all the uh, you know, technology available to have the call. Um, there is a potential for the reduction of, of VMT that goes with that ability to, to telecommute. Um, so I agree with Laura that uh, you know, data is not in yet, um, but the anecdotal information suggests that um, you know, doing, uh, doing conference calls while you're out walking around uh, is a healthy thing. That's great. That's great. Um, you know, there's a number of questions too, where folks are really ask, asking about kind of the success of working from home. Uh, do you think that, uh, you know, just like if, if you had to say today, like what the magnitude of that change might be in the future, and especially as planners are really trying to, to do some of that long range planning, um, you know, uh, what, what kinds of changes do you think we should, and, and I know it's total con kind of conjecture here, but um, what kind of additional changes, you know, what, what is the magnitude of, of people potentially working from home, do you think? So I have, less as a data person, I'm also, I'm a CEO, right? Like I run a business that has 90 employees, right? I'm a small business manager too. So we've seen two things that are really interesting. One, Streetlight always had a one day work from home policy because it's good for VMT, right? Like we know this, so we try to walk the walk and talk the talk. I think, especially if you have to have fewer people in the office at the same time, what I've been hearing from a lot of the tech community is eventually coming to like a, some people are Monday, Wednesday people and other people are the Tuesday, Thursday people. So maybe partial work from home. But the other thing that's been really interesting is um, a lot of our clients are public agencies. Most of our clients are public agencies. And some of them had a beast of a time transitioning to work from home. Like they didn't know, they couldn't log in. They didn't have flat, like it was a whole thing. We were trying to support them. But in the past few weeks, they've all nailed it. So I think like if you think of it as an enzyme, like a lot of the activation energy has been overcome. Um, and that's been, so these are me speaking as a business owner, not as a data person. It's been really interesting to watch and it makes me think it will be stickier. Yeah. I can, uh, and I can, I can, that, that's, that's, that's comparable to, to my experience as well. It's, it's, I run an office in San Francisco of 25 employees and, you know, we've been doing surveys of our employers and, you know, with the exception of one or two of them, you know, none of them are eager to, to really get back into the office and the extent to which they, they want to be back in the office, maybe they want to be back in the office two or three days. And that's, that's really through the end of, end of the year, you know, and then that further is, is, is kind of informed by, you know, their comfort of, of getting back on, on transit, whether or not regional or, or local transit um, is available to them. So just from, from that perspective, it, it just made me really realize that the, or reinforce that we're just in this really for the, for the long haul. And, you know, we need to give people, you know, a tremendous amount of kind of, um, you know, deference with respect to, you know, if they want to work from home, continuing to support that. And then, you know, as, as businesses continuing to kind of make that investment to make sure that that's kind of a, a seamless experience as, as, as possible. But I would note that, you know, that their, their experience is, is or all of our experiences are, are different, you know, um, you know, those are a little bit more established, you know, that maybe just have a little bit more comfortable home or, or literally live outside of San Francisco, um, you know, have a, have a different experience. You know, we've been able to invest in our homes. Maybe we have a little bit more space, got a yard, kind of experience that. Maybe we've got children at home. But, you know, there, there are many others that are, that are young to move to the city to establish themselves, you know, or, or meet their partner or establish their career, you know, that are kind of kind of bumped by in, in a, you know, in, in kind of shared um, roommate situations or, or studios and things like that. And, um, and, and some, of those, some of those people, I think, actually might be, you know, even more eager to, to get back into the office, you know, um, you know once that, that option is available to them. Mm -hmm. So it's just a, a real kind of diversity of experience. Yeah, I know it was really fascinating when we were talking about this panel, and sometimes there was a lot more uh, information about what we didn't know than what we do know. And so, Ron, what do you think are some of the biggest gaps in the available data, and especially related to ride hailing or even on-demand delivery services? We barely even touched on like the restaurant delivery. Kind of, how are you working around those gaps or, or are you able to, to capture it in the, the kind of um, the work that you're doing? Yeah, well, one really big gap that we hadn't even thought of before is how people factor health risk into their decisions about what activities to engage in and whether or not they're gonna travel. Um, so I don't have a, a risk variable in my, uh, in my models. 
So we have a, a bit of a blind spot there. Um, with respect to the, what we can observe uh, through data, uh, like, uh, like street lights or others, um, we can see uh, the bike and ped trips uh, better now. We can see the, uh, the TNC trips. Uh, I like uh, one of Laura's analogies. TNCs uh, are like a, a Roomba. Uh, you know, they basically bounce around all over the place. So you can kind of identify them in the data. Um, but it's hard for us to get down to some of the data we need to um, make decisions. Uh, for example, at the curb, um, Eric and I were involved with, uh, with Uber in one of the studies where we were looking at uh, the new metric, um, you know, curb space productivity. And it required a lot of video um, of basically curbs and watching um, what TNC drivers do and, and what passengers do in terms of how long it takes to load and unload to figure out how do we, you know, create a model for, you know, passenger, uh, passenger demand. So there are still holes in the data and it can be still you know, expensive to, to collect, but it's getting you know, better all the time. Uh, so I'd say right now, some of the biggest uh, challenges, the, the health risk variable, um, I would also add on the, the, the TNC front, you know, they don't keep track of the number of passengers per vehicle. And so when you're trying to estimate things like greenhouse gas emissions per, per vehicle mile of travel or per passenger mile of travel, um, that's not always easy to get because they don't keep track of the passengers. Um, and then we don't know um, with respect to, to transit, you know, that health risk factor, how will it restart and what will be the expectations of users? Are they forced to use it or are they going to be uh, willing to, uh, to use it under certain circumstances? So plenty of data gaps that we're still going to need to fill um, as we look forward.